Good evening and welcome everyone to the Longmont Library's presentation of Diversity in Tech with Dr. DeBeau. Uh, before I get started, I want to thank the Friends of the Longmont Library for their support for so much of the work we do, including programs like these. We really depend on them to get uh, a lot of our work done. Um, if you'd like to join them or find out more about what they do, please visit www.friendsofthelongmontlibrary.org. Uh, all right, well, so they welcome to our program, Diversity in Tech. Um, I'd like to give a little introduction to our presenter. Uh, Dr. Wendy Dubow is a senior research scientist and the director of evaluation at a nonprofit organization housed at the University of Colorado at Boulder called the National Center for Women and in Information Technology, or NCWIT. Its mission is to change the face of technology by helping K-12 K through 12, post-secondary and industry organizations bring greater diversity into the entire computing ecosystem by using research-based approaches. And so I'm just going to uh, repeat for anybody that didn't hear, we're going to be taking questions through the chat. So if you do have questions, just put them in there. Um, we will, there, there will, there will be um, during the presentation uh, opportunities to, to discuss kind of live, but otherwise we're going to be gathering those questions and uh, holding them till the end for the question and answers. All right, well, enough for me. Um, I'm going to leave it for uh, Dr. Dubow. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for joining this evening. Um, I have some research and data to share with you. And then as Johannes mentioned, we'll have um, some, there'll be some conversation points where I'll queue and then we'll, there's, there'll be time for taking questions at the end. So let me share my screen and get started. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see this. And I, so now I won't be able to see the chat um, or any of you, so. Um, I will be counting on the library partners to let me know what's going on <laughs> in there. All right, so as Johannes mentioned, NCWIT, the National Center for Women in Information Technology, is um, a nonprofit organization. We think of ourselves as a community um, because we bring together more than 1,400 organizations across the U.S. To, um, who are all working on increasing the meaningful and influential participation of all women in computing. So women at the intersections of race, ethnicity, class, age, sexual orientation, and disability status. So in the work that I do, there are really three central ideas that we come up against in trying to bring uh, greater diversity to the field of technology. And the first one is that tech talent is innate. Um, so that this idea that people are naturally good at computing, at computer science or engineering. And in, in social psychology, we call this a fixed mindset. It assumes that people have an innate talent in tech and that only those people with an innate talent can succeed in the field. But it completely overlooks the fact that those who come off those who come off as innately talented have been exposed to computer science early on, they've been encouraged, they've had access in their school, and that those who seem like they don't have innate talent, innate talent probably weren't exposed to computer science or encouraged along the way or didn't seem like they belonged. So a more productive way to approach looking at tech is with a growth mindset. And it's really a more productive way of looking at any field, right? That Exposure and practice are what make you good at something. Not, it's not that you're innately born with it. And then the second kind of concept that we work um, against and with is that technology is a meritocracy. In other words, in technology, you'll succeed and you'll move up in your career if you're good at what you do. That ability plus effort equals success. In this belief system, there aren't any structural barriers. There are only sort of individual barriers that the individuals themselves put up. But this perspective ignores just scads of research showing that there's 
bias in classrooms, bias in workplaces, stereotypes of what engineers should look like, and that sort of thing. But in general, Americans are really attracted to this idea of a meritocracy. Americans, more than people from other countries, like to believe that people are rewarded for their intelligence and their skills. And they're less likely to believe that family wealth, for example, plays a role in people getting ahead. Um, so that meritocracy, well, all of these ideas actually aren't restricted to technology, but we come up against them quite a lot. And then the, the third concept on here is that technology is neutral. The idea is, you know, technology itself is inanimate. It, it responds to a series of zeros and ones. It's a machine, so it must be inherently fair and neutral. And it's this last assumption that I'm going to tackle this evening. So I'm going to start with two quotes from Dr. Ruha Benjamin. Uh, she's a sociologist and an associate professor at Princeton University. And she primarily focuses on the relationship between innovation and equity. So she says, the human values, assumptions, desires, and worldviews that shape technology are often left unexplored. At the moment, only a narrow slice of humanity is doing the shaping. And that's really the, the nexus of what um, NCWIT focuses on, is trying to expand that slice of humanity that's doing the shaping. And she goes on to say, from um, based on her research, that the, the imagined technology user is gendered, raced, and classed without gender, race, or class ever being mentioned. And it's precisely by ignoring social reality that tech designers will almost certainly reproduce it. So it's important to understand who's creating our technology and who isn't. So um, we're going to explore basically what does it mean to this narrow slice of our population and how did that come about. So in this uh, first slide, it's showing that there's a low participation of women in the development of tech. The big um, half circle of blue or a little more than half circle shows that um, among professional occupations, women hold more than half of those jobs in professional occupations. But if you look at just computing occupations, women only hold a quarter of those jobs. And as you look at computing subfields, it's, it's often even worse, though it varies. And here we show computer hardware engineers and um, software engineers at less than even a quarter percent, a quarter um, of the population. And um, here in this slide, the blue line on the outside of the circle is the percentage of um, chief information officer positions, and that's about 18%, just to kind of give you a gauge. And that's chief information officer positions in the top 1,000 companies in, um, in the US. And you can see there's uneven participation of women of color in the development of technology. And so while Asian women may be somewhat overrepresented for their um, proportion in the population, Black women and Hispanic and Lat Latina women are very much underrepresented in um, tech. So there aren't a lot of great metrics out there for measuring innovation. One of the things we're concerned with at our organization is the, is the creation of technology, right? The innovation, the creative aspect. Um, but one of the metrics that we use uh, is the extent to which women have contributed to patenting because these, these um, statistics exist, we can get our hands on them, and they can be an indicator, right, of, um, of innovation. And I don't know how easy this would be to see at, on your monitors at home, but um, the gist of this is that the, that first column, the women only teams, um, you can see it's, it's in all categories, less than 3% um, of patents are by women only teams. In mixed gender teams, it gets a little better. But in that last column, clearly the majority of patents are men only teams. And so this is something we're really trying to influence. And then the last kind of grounding statistic that I want to um, give you is, is this, that in the private sector um, tech industry, women leave at twice the rate of men. And so whenever I share that statistic, people, I think a lot of times automatically go to this idea, oh, well, that's because women have, you know, historically had more family responsibilities 
and that sort of thing. But that's not what's going on here. 80% of them are staying in the workforce full time. They're just leaving the private tech sector. And so they're going to nonprofits or they're starting their own businesses um, or they're going um, into the public sector. And so clearly there's something going on in the private sector workplace culture. And that's one of the things we try to um, affect. <clears throat> so what's at risk when you have this much under uh, or disproportionate representation and underrepresentation of certain groups in tech? And the risk of not having heterogeneous teams is losing out on the advantages that they bring. And so here's a quote from um, a influential researcher, Scott Cage, where he has done a lot of work on, on the value that diversity brings. And so uh, to simplify one of his conclusions, groups with greater diversity solve complex problems faster and better than homogenous groups. And so there's a lot of data on this idea that diverse teams, when they're managed well, contribute to companies' bottom, bottom lines and to innovation. And so there's quite a lot at risk. And even if it's social justice aside, right, there's a, there's a um, business case to be made and an innovation case to be made. Um, so even in this awkward uh, online format, I wanted to try to have some interactivity. Um, so if you want to write into the chat some ideas why you think there might be underrepresentation of certain groups in the field of technology. And I won't be able to see it, but um, Kirsten from the library or Johannes will say it. And if no one has any ideas, I certainly have some ideas on this. <laughs> oh, I do get to see it a little bit. Um, it went fast, though. <laughs> the comment is, girls are not given encouragement during formative schooling. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's definitely true. There's, a, there, there's definitely a lot of data around that, both from all kinds of adult influencers, right? Like teachers, as well as parents and counselors, even, you know, those who are certain are well-meaning and want to encourage their girls. I think there's a, there's a feeling that there's a lack of fit. That's true. Any other ideas? I'll, I'll share with you my ideas and things I can tell you about. Um, so what I what we focus on a lot um, because you know we draw from the social science research around these things to, to try to impact um, diversity in practical ways is is to talk about to recognize and um, and surface structural and unconscious biases or implicit biases. And these kinds of things start early. So um, there's a study of preschool teachers that showed when teachers, teachers were given a, a preschool situation to observe, and they were told that there may be some challenging behavior happening in this preschool classroom. And, and they, were, um, they were told to observe it and look for that behavior and try to identify it. And they had this eye tracking software on them. And it, it, the results were that they basically watched the black boys in the classroom much more than the rest of the children. And, and I should say too, that like these situations were set up so that there was no acting out, like nobody was behaving badly. But when they were told they needed to identify it, that's whom they looked for, is the black boys. And, and I'll say as an aside that when the teachers were given back the results you know, of the study, they were, um, the majority of them, like something like, um, you know, 348 out of 352 of them were completely shocked by this. Like this was set, this was operating at such an unconscious level. They had no idea they were doing it. They didn't want to be doing it. They didn't have any kind of conscious connection that that was happening. So um, it's sort of just how deeply ingrained and subtle these kinds of things are. Um, in fact, black preschoolers are more likely to receive suspensions than white preschoolers. 
which is such an astounding fact to me that any preschoolers receive suspensions, honestly. Um, but throughout their educational experience, African American and, and Latinx students are more likely to be disciplined harshly and sent out of class. Um, but these systemic biases exist at all levels of our society. And certainly, you know, we've been paying more attention lately to them in the justice system, but they're also in the healthcare system and financial system. Um, one really clear example of systemic bias, because I think sometimes it's hard for people to wrap their heads around systemic bias. Um, but a clear example is redlining. And some people know about it and some people don't. So I'll explain it. But it was the system that was once used by banks and the real estate industry. And it literally outlined in red neighborhoods where people of color lived. And if you lived inside those red lines, then loans were almost impossible to come by because they were considered too risky by banks. So in 1968, the practice was banned as racist, but there were still these loopholes that, that um, banks and, and real estate um, folks could use to continue that kind of inequity. And its impact lives on so that um, one of the ways that people in the US amass wealth or have wealth is through uh, housing equity. And, and so black families have been prevented basically from having that kind of um, equity because of this, these policy based um, biases. And according to the Federal Reserve, like the net worth of a typical white family is 171,000. It's 10 times greater than that of a black family. So these things have huge repercussions. I'm going to give you a completely different type of example. Uh, if you look at task assignments at work, um, there's often a pattern of women being given note taking or party planning responsibilities, despite having the same credentials as the men in the room. And this is in tech and not in tech, you know, just sort of in general. And, and that kind of activity affects women's ability to move up the career ladder, you know, partly because of the time spent on these ancillary tasks, and also because they start to be seen differently by their colleagues and maybe particularly their male colleagues. Um, another uh, structural bias are recruiting and hiring practices that favor the social networks of existing employees because we tend to socialize and become close with people who are most like us, who share our background in some way. So if people, if organizations are hiring through their own employees' networks, it's going to stay relatively homogenous. Um, and there are, believe it or not, grooming policies at workplaces that disadvantage people with um, Afro textured hair or that say you can't have braids or you can't have dreads or things like that, which again, you know, ends up uh, being biased against certain groups of people. Okay, so all those factors that I just discussed and, and that you all brought up um, are about people, but surely the engineering development process is neutral, right? <laughs> Unfortunately not. So what you see here on the right side, um, of the screen is a development process waterfall diagram, it's called. It's used by um, a lot of engineers, but it's used by the US Food and Drug Administration. In this case, that's what this waterfall diagram is to create medical devices. And so in case um, people have a hard time seeing this, it's at the top, there's user needs and that feeds into design input, which feeds into the design process feeding into the output and resulting in the medical device. And then at various stages, there's review and verification and validation um, processes that occur. So uh, again, putting it out to you all, even though I can't see you, <laughs> uh, where do you suppose in this development process bias could creep in? You can just write into the chat. I think um, one person said in the design input. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and somebody else said, it's hard for me to see, sorry. <laughs> but I see that someone else said, um, everywhere user needs, often they aren't looking at the right users. Yes, 
And yeah. someone also said validation. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, basically it's a trick question. Like, you know, the one person noted at every single, every single one of these um, junctures, there are, there are humans involved, right? So at every single one of these junctures, some kind of bias um, could set in. And I could see from some of the things that you all were saying that you were thinking about it in just the right way. Um, so I wondered, um, again, this is a bit awkward, right, with WebEx, but um, we should still try it. Are, what are some examples of technology that you all have seen or heard of that are, that are biased? You can think about products or devices or software or, and if you don't have examples, I do. <laughs> well, I've heard of a uh, problem actually recently with um, AI and COVID in selecting, um, you know, based on certain criteria, but apparently not in criteria that that include you know those people that spend a lot of time with COVID patients, you know age and you know position, but not uh, not actual time spent with patients. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. So that feels like that sort of reflects on um, not gathering the right kinds of data to feed into the. Um, the, the prioritization system. And someone okay. says facial recognition software that doesn't recognize non-white non faces. Mm -hmm. Perfect segue, because that's the first one I was going to talk about. <laughs> and someone um, says the cost of tech itself. What was it? The cost of tech? Uh-huh. Oh, I see. Right. You mean in terms of access to technology because it's cost prohibitive? I guess, I'm guessing that's what that comment means. Yeah, that's very interesting. True. Um, okay. So uh, I'll talk about facial recognition, which uh, one of you brought up. So the, the research on facial recognition and all these other kinds of the ones you all brought up and what I'm going to talk about, you know, they basically shatter the myth of of machine neutrality, um, if if anyone still believes it. And I think people do still believe it. I mean, I believed it until I started thinking about it more and learning about it more. Um, so, and in, in, there's a couple of different examples, but the, in, in the one I'm sharing with you now, um, there were systems from these major companies that were unable to classify darker women's faces as accurately as those of white men. And I showed in the picture here Joy Bulamini um, because she's a prominent researcher in this area, even though she's only a graduate student still um, at MIT. But there are other people in um, doing this research too. And in her studies, though, she showed that the error, um, oh, there's a typo in my slide, that the errors were significantly higher for darker women's faces than for lighter men's. And you know, not to call out IBM, but at the time it was up to 34% of, of a higher error rate for IBM's um, system. And I guess the the bright side of this is not that face this kind of discrimination has gone away, but in these particular cases around um, the particular systems they were talking about here, when they were publicly outed, the companies did release new APIs with significantly lower error rates, and, and they actually even made the most improvement in identifying um, black women's faces because they had fared the worst in the original API. So, um, I, I mean, I find that gratifying in the sense that, you know, um, once things are brought to light, sometimes there really are changes that are made. Uh, another category of um, technology where bias has implications is um, in voice recognition. And so in the first example there, automakers have admitted for years that their speech recognition doesn't work as well for women. And the recommended remedy was that women should do extensive training. And one automaker uh, leader was quoted as saying, 
women should be taught to speak louder and direct their voices toward the microphone. Um, so the solution, right, for them, which they were perfectly happy to go public with, was that women would have to learn to use the technology differently than their male peers, rather than change the software so that it works for everyone. And the same kinds of implications of these automobile voice recognition um, came out for racial ethnic, certain racial ethnic groups and for people with accents. And um, I mean, I know that my voice recognition in my car doesn't work very well. <laughs> I don't know if it's because of my gender or because of my car, um, but hopefully it's improved in some newer cars. I don't really know. And then speech to text services. Um, a recent Stanford University study showed that for uh, batch transcriptions of speech to text, the, they misidentified the words of black speakers at nearly double the rate of white speakers. So these are services that are used by, again, you know, sort of all the same big name tech companies, and they're systematically um, not, not serving black people as well. Um, and then in the third one, there are phones and microphones. Uh, decades ago, work at Bell Labs, um, who came up with the first voice answering machine, set a specific voice frequency band that still governs how our phones and microphones work today. Um, and our founder actually and our um, former CFO were at Bell Labs when this was being developed and they talk about how voicemail recording systems didn't pick up women's voices at first. And that was, you know, very literally because there were no women at the innovation table coming up with that. And they clearly didn't test with women either. Um, so these are all just very kind of obvious examples of how they could have done better. Um, so a lack of diversity on the innovation team can result also in a hand soap dispenser that literally didn't work for darker skin hands. And maybe some of you will remember this. It went viral in 2017. Um, and there was a kind of video scene of a, a, a dark hand under the hand soap dispenser and no soap comes out and a white hand and the soap comes out. And um, and that's that little video uh, was tweeted and shared more than 93,000 times and had almost 2 million, 2 million views. And I think it's like people were really struck by the, I think the literalness of it, you know, that a white hand could get soap and a black hand couldn't. And there was optical recognition at the heart of this technology, the infrared sensor. It just, again, apparently wasn't tested on people of color. So then it ended up just not performing for a large portion of the population who'd be using it. As a side note, my understanding is that that soap dispenser was um, in the offices at Facebook, and it was a Facebook employee <laughs> who took that video and went viral with it. Just sort of, there's some irony in there somewhere. Um, another example is wearable heart rate trackers that um, have been shown to be inaccurate for people with darker skin. So if you go into a doctor's office, um, they use infrared light to obtain your heart rate, but these consumer products that you can buy use um, green light because it's cheaper. And the light in the gadgets that you can buy functions as the optical sensor to track the volume of blood at the wrist where it um, meets the skin. Um, but melanin interferes with that green light and so people with darker skin don't get as accurate of readings as people with lighter skin. And the implications of that are huge once you look into it. Apparently more than 40 million people wear these heart rate trackers. And a lot of people, you know, wear them for sports reasons, like especially here in Boulder County, right? But, but other people are wearing them because they have serious heart issues and it's actually a life and death situation. And um, they count on their heart rate monitor to to signal that they need to take medicine or they need to use their defibrillator or something. And so when those monitor readings are wrong for them, it's not just a, um, an individual tragedy or potential tragedy, it's, it's a public health inequity, right? Because it's certain groups of people systematically not um, having this technology work well for them. And again, it's because developers didn't think through how the tech would work with all users. 
um, this, this example I'm calling logistics bias. Um, and so Amazon was accused of bias for offering free shipping to Jewish settlements in the West Bank and not to Palestinian towns. And the way that worked out is because they, they offered free shipping on orders of $49 or more, um, but your address had to be listed as Israel. And, um, but residents of Palestinian communities, if they wrote Palestinian territories on their address, which they would, and um, then they would have to pay shipping and handling fees. And so, you know, this probably was made as a logistical decision, right? These are contested borders. I'm sure that, you know, they, the Amazon trucks are going to have to go through security. Sometimes maybe the borders are closed. Like there are a lot of logistical reasons for this to happen. But nonetheless, the end result is, again, this systematic bias. Um, and Amazon got into trouble on, I don't have a slide on it, but you know, in a couple of other instances too about, not to pick on Amazon, um, but about same day delivery. Like they were, they were same day delivery is um, available to, to um, how can I put this? In, in major cities like Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, um, black citizens are about half as likely to live in neighborhoods with access to Amazon same day delivery as as white citizens. So they're they're discriminating again based on locality. And there may be logistical reasons for that, but nonetheless, again, it's systematic exclusion. Um, but my understanding is that at least with this Israel example and maybe with some of the city examples too, again, once that was surfaced, then they changed um, their delivery practices. Maybe my underlying point in this whole presentation is that activism matters, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, okay, so we've talked about sort of the reasons for underrepresentation in technology in terms of um, biases and you know, there's a host of other reasons, but that's what we're focusing on tonight. We talked about how um, that can have ramifications in the technology that we use and who gets to use it. And and then now what? <laughs> um, so, whoops. There we go. Um, guess what we try to get a, across is that um, product development, software, algorithms, policy, all these things reflect the decision and the understandings of people who write them. So if you think about the process of algorithm creation, so algorithm is just the set of instructions that tells um, a technology, a, a computer or whatever, to perform a specific task. But like we sort of have referenced before, um, the criteria for what data will be collected and what factors um, will have influence and what will be weighed with the most and least influence are all decided by people. Um, when algorithms are set to display or to act on relevant data, all these set points are also decided by people. And sometimes they're based on previous choices by other users or, or choices the designers themselves are making. Um, Recommendation engines, they often rely on inaccurate assumptions and associations with um, you know, gender stereotypes or, or stereotypes about racial ethnic groups, that kind of thing. And so unchecked, all these different choices that happen during algorithm creation can reinforce stereotypes you know, or other social divisions. And so they have um, consequences. And then, and one of the consequences is that, like even algorithms that that are determining risk, can discriminate. So loan availability, like that redlining example that I talked about earlier, um, you know, that's an algorithm that's determining it. But it's these days, but it's determining it based on factors that are put in. And so redlining, credit scores, neighborhood values, those are all things that are determined, predetermined with values. Um, allocation of resources. I think a lot about broadband availability and how it's unavailable often in rural areas or on reservations. And um, 
you know, that's because there's a risk assessment there, like, oh, there's not enough people to to, um, to make this worthwhile or whatever. But again, it, it ends up with systematic exclusion of certain kinds of people. Um, educational opportunities are thinking there of um, like scoring on, on standardized tests, which often have their own biases baked in that determine school placements. Um, so what we try to do is get our stakeholders and um, others who've listened <laughs> to start from a place of admitting that these things are in the purview of the computer scientist or engineer. So when I'm talking to technologists with these talks, it's you know trying to get them to understand that that there are human factors all the way through. It's not just at what they consider you know human factors kind of work, and that they're not objective, and that there's really there are real human consequences. So all of the examples that um, I've discussed and that you all have brought up, I mean, they typically do not stem from malicious intent, and. You know, we all we all come into this world with, um, or maybe we don't come into this world. That's the wrong way to say it. But we all have biases, and um, you know, and raising our awareness around them, um, learning how to interrupt them for ourselves and for others, like that can make a difference. But until we have awareness around them, they're influencing how we how we act and how we develop um, technologies or whatever you do in your own um, workplace. And people's biases can have a really negative impact, you know. And so we've been talking about that in the context of tech. And um, so we talk, we um, do a lot of supporting of tech companies and also um, computer science and information science kinds of departments at post-secondary institutions and um, and groups that work in K-12, like 4-H or Girl Scouts or Black Girls Code or things like that. And we try to um, get them to think about all of these things and more. And so I sort of chose here sort of the things that we talk to tech companies about since I use so many tech company examples. Um, so we encourage them to get educated, to think about who's at the table and who's not, um, and to actively gather information from those that aren't represented. Um, to be curious and to question their processes and conclusions, especially if the team is homo homogenous. And this is true in any context, right? I don't think it just applies to tech at all. Um, to be thoughtful in the case of those um, artificial intelligence AI examples that we've talked about, you know, to say that voice recognition, like take audio samples from a socially and racially stratified sample of speakers and have make sure that the software is testing against that. Um, and be thorough, that's sort of similar, right, to, con to conduct testing across different demographic categories too. Um, and finally, you know, to make sure that people, to be inclusive, make sure people in your classroom or on your team um, feel respected so that they'll speak up if they disagree or if they notice something that they think needs their needs everyone's attention. Um, so even if you're not in tech, which I'm guessing most people aren't on this call, um, you can make a difference in the work that you do moving forward just by thinking about <clears throat> what we've discussed here tonight and by checking your own and your teammates and your family's biases. And I include some, um, we have I think 200 something resources that are based on social science um, that are focused on tech in one way or another. But I have a couple of examples here of things that have to do with bias, like we've been talking about, that could be relevant um, to a number of settings. And so you can explore them and then uh, see what you can do about making changes within your own sphere of influence. and. I know you don't have access to those URLs, but you can just go to our website if you are interested and um, look for resources on bias. And um, that is the end of my talk. <laughs> so I'll stop sharing and then if there are any uh, questions or um, we can talk about it. Yeah, if there are any questions, any comments, please uh, put them in the chat.
um, there was a comment that somebody made uh, early on. Um, it said, you talked about innate talent and how it's really more about exposure and practice. It makes me think of all the popular video games, many of which do allow for both expo exposure and practice of technology in a broad sense are geared towards boys. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point um, that a lot of times, you know, um, boys themselves will feel like they're really good at tech, you know, and and um, and and that is because a lot of I think it's actually changing, but historically, um, you know, video games were primarily played by boys and men, and so that it does increase this kind of um, technology technological facility. But uh, as I understand it, um, girls and women are are playing a lot more video games these days. And so maybe that there's people are investigating the connection between that video game um, enjoyment and whether people will actually go into tech and try to, you know, make technology themselves. But I, you know, um, intuitively, there's got to, there's a connection, right? Like if people enjoy being on the computer, they enjoy thinking about that. If they really love a game, they're going to want to try to dash in a game themselves and that may be a way to lead them into the tech. Well, and for my, just from my own experience, I wonder, especially talking about video games, that, I mean, I notice and, and you know, forgive me for anybody who's seen the opposite of my experience, but growing up with brothers, and having boys as children, I have, and somebody brought this to my attention, and they said, you know, it's interesting because when I watch, um, you know, younger boys play together, it's about competition. It's about who wins, <laughs> you know, who, who gets better than the other. And they said, you know, but when I see younger girls play together, it's a collaboration. They want to do something together. They want to build something. It's not about pushing others down so that you can come up, but it's more about this. It's about a inter interrelationships. And I I wonder if you know the the games that are played. You know, there a lot of them are very competitive. You know, high scores, who gets you know the resource, that sort of thing. And I wonder even if that is kind of it's just sort of setting up that culture of okay, you know, technology is, is, is going to be this competition instead of this collaboration. And I don't know if you've, if you've seen that in your research or I'm just kind of making that up, but that's what I've, I think I've noticed. Yeah, it, it's interesting. And people bring that kind of thing up a lot. And, you know, I guess I would say a few things. Like one is that, um, you know, there's definitely no research that girls shy away from competition, you know, in any way. Um, and I think that collaboration happens within both genders, but there's still, you know, these societal pushes and the games are one of those pushes that, um, you know, that again, kind of make it, make one set of behaviors okay within, uh, girls and one another set of behaviors seem better in boys and um and so i think there's some of that tension going on but um and there could be something about you know that if if you are a boy and you've been inculcated into the world of tech like you were saying johannes by playing these games that are actually quite um not about building on each other's work but about defeating each other and if if that's been your sort of computing culture and then you get into a um, you know a computing classroom or computer science classroom and you have that mentality that's a really exclusive mentality too and we do see that in the computer science classroom environment quite often so yeah there's something in there for sure and somebody also notes my granddaughters are interested in coding as a result of playing video games Mm -hmm. And another person says, my experience with young women slash girls and tech is that it's used more for communication than competition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and some of those, like, build, it's not, it's, it's, um, 
you know, when people are trying to bring more girls into tech at that, say, in the, you know, in secondary school, in the K-12 level, they often will sort of draw on those, the ways in which girls are um, socialized, you know, so, um, and that can be a way to recruit them in, regardless of, you know, what other characteristics they may have, like that can, those building on, on those um, behaviors can be a good way to recruit. So, yeah, I can see all of that that was said. Hmm. Well, I have one, I have more questions. I, I'm really interested in this, and so <laughs> I'm making sure that to read anybody that's putting in comments, but I have to ask some more <laughs> now that I have you here. Um, what, I guess, have you seen any overarching trends in the last, say, 10 years? You know, what stands out to you as big change? Mm, that's a good question. Um, well, one is uh, that the idea of diversity in tech has become a common concept in the in popular media. And, mm -hmm. and when my organization started, or even when I started at the organization 12 years ago, you know, nobody was talking about this. Nobody was paying attention to the idea that technology was being created by a, um, <clears throat> you know, a, a small portion, a narrow slice of the population. Um, the companies weren't talking about it. Popular media wasn't talking about it. But boy, there's been so much attention to that in the last decade. And then now, you know, there was a little while back in 2014 or so um, where Jesse Jackson was part of the push with the Rainbow Coalition, but to get companies to release their diversity numbers, if, if anybody remembers that, you know, to release, it was essentially like show show us how diverse or not diverse your employee base is. And that was huge. That was, they were so resistant, you know, and, and, um, and so that happened and then they pledged to make things better. And then of course, with the racial justice movements recently, now there's, and, and the focus on social media, like it's all sort of intersecting and coalescing and there's so much more attention being paid to this issue. Um, and and before also people would push, or organizations would push back on us sometimes around, you know, oh, well, gender bias is something that's so ingrained in society, there's nothing we can do about it, or racial bias is so ingrained, it's bigger than us. And now I feel like, you know, we're in a moment potentially in our in U.S. society where it's getting attention from all sides. And so if you're technology, you know, if you're a tech company and you have that much um, <clears throat> attention that you're also getting, then you kind of have to keep up with the times and, um, and and try to put some real muscle and action behind the words that they're putting out. So I don't know, it's really, it has, it has definitely changed in terms of the national conversation. Interesting. All right, well, it looks like we don't have any further questions. So I will say thank you so much for coming and presenting and especially thank you everyone for coming and uh, attending. I really appreciate the time that you that you took to come talk to us. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. Hope to see you soon. And um, we are going to be posting this recording on our YouTube channel. Um, it usually takes one to two weeks for that to get up there. But be looking for it. It will go up. And um, yeah, have a great night. Bye, everybody. Bye.